Uh, what we're going to be dis discussing itself today is going to be the O1J transmission. Uh, per se, a couple things uh, that you need to be aware of. Uh, first off, I've updated the handout for this particular presentation. And so uh, you're going to want to go back online and physically get the newest, latest, greatest handout. It uh, will actually say revised on the handout itself so that you know you got the latest and greatest handout. I've uh, made some changes physically to the uh, handout. So again, you're going to want to make sure you get a hold of that, throw away the old handout, and simply use the new handout because that's going to follow what we're doing here today. Uh, along with that, you're probably noticing that I'm a little bit on the horse uh, side of things here. i got a heck of a head cold going on, so if you hear me coughing and hacking, you'll know basically what's up at this point. So with those two things, let's do a little bit of uh, housekeeping. First off, I'd like to uh, thank the folks from Seal Aftermarket Products. We certainly uh, appreciate uh, the folks from Seal Aftermarket Products themselves um, uh, basically uh, uh, supporting our uh, webinar assembly. Uh, we, again, appreciate those guys doing that uh, because without them, of course, we can't bring the webinars to you free of charge. So again, appreciate all the guys from Seal Aftermarket Products supporting our webinars uh, as we uh, go through the presentation today. If you got some questions about ATRA or uh, ATRA uh, membership, contact lwiggins at atra.com. He'd love to hear from you. And again, uh, on the uh, housekeeping side of it, on the connections, make sure you're a hardwired connection. We've had lots of issues with wireless routers. Uh, so again, make sure you're hardwired. The handout we've already talked about. If you do run into troubles, guys, getting the handout, get a hold of Sean over at ATRA. You can just simply call him on the telephone, 805-604-2000, and uh, ask for Sean. And he will make sure that you get a copy of the handout itself if you're having troubles finding it. But he told me yesterday that he put it right on the website, so everybody should be able to find uh, the handout itself right there. If you have a question as we're going through this material today, feel free to ask it. Uh, again, the bottom line is uh, the easiest way to ask a question is simply click on the questions box, and the question you will then type in and hit the submit key. It's going to pop right up on the screen, and I'll try to answer your question at that point. The survey itself is an automated survey. Uh, the survey will typically be following uh, the presentation that we do today. Big thanks to uh, Mike uh, Sosa and, uh, of course, uh, Audi. So again, uh, Mike and Audi folks provided me some nice pictures so we can, of course, uh, uh, make sure we got a nice quality presentation for everybody today. And again, a big appreciation for those two people. Now our subject today is going to be the Audi Multitronic which is a version of CVT, a little bit different kind of CVT from what you may have been used to, uh, like when we talked about the Chrysler CVT here a while back. Uh, again, this is a little bit different as far as operation is concerned. It is called a CVT because it actually is a constantly variable transmission. It is model code 01J. Uh, again, you're seeing the different applications there on your screen showing you basically what the uh, applications that this thing came out in. If you notice, there is no torque converter. There is no clutch on this transmission either. Uh, so effectively, what they do when you pull up the stoplight is they slip the forward clutch or slip the reverse clutch, depending on if you're in the forward range or reverse range. It does use a single uh, dampener style flywheel on the V6 applications and a dual mass flywheel on the four cylinder applications. But again, there's no clutch plate. Uh, per se, with either one of those applications. You got one forward clutch and you have one reverse clutch. Again, the bottom line is they're going to slip this clutch uh, to provide you effectively uh, a neutral position when you're setting still at a stoplight. So again, bottom line is it works a little bit differently than some of the other transmissions you guys may have dealt with in the past. You're going to find one planetary gear set in the unit. That planetary is used for reverse. Um, the planetary itself uh, is going to be controlled by the reverse clutch. So when you select reverse, effectively what the reverse clutch is doing is holding your planetary for you so that you can end up with a reverse range. Torque is transmitted through a final drive assembly into the variators. Uh, the variators themselves, uh, the variators themselves again feed that uh, force directly to the final drive, and the final drive of course feeds it out to your axles. The uh, variators are the fancy words for meaning the pulleys in this system itself, 
and this is actually a chain-driven uh, pulley system they've got rather than a belt-driven pulley system like you're used to seeing with other CVTs. Now, one word of wisdom for you on these transmissions, there are actually two different chains that are available, two different width chains. The bottom line, guys, is this. The chains are available in two different widths, so you want to make sure that when you put a chain on one of these transmissions that you get the correct chain because obviously installing the wrong chain is going to cause you major troubles uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, uh, getting the uh, correct ratio out of the transmission itself. So again, make sure that you got the correct chain on your particular application. The computer on this thing, the TCM, is mounted in the back of the valve body assembly, basically bolted into the valve body right on the back of the transmission itself. It's, contain, it's going to contain some cell light drivers. It's going to contain, obviously, uh, a couple pressure switches. Um, it's going to also have some speed sensor uh, inputs for it. Actually, we use three separate speed sensors on this. All that's contained in the TCM itself. You have two basic uh, functions as far as shift uh, functions on this transmission. One is called Tiptronic, which basically is the manual shift mode. And the other is called Multitronic, which is the automatic shift mode. So you can choose either one of those that you want to. Again, if you choose the Tiptronic mode, then it's going to be a feature where you actually have to choose to shift the transmission. Now, we talked about this thing they call, being called the O1J. Actually, uh, Volkswagen and, v and uh, Audi call it a VL30. So I've put those designations up there. So if, if somebody you're dealing with <clears throat> doesn't recognize the O1J reference, you can tell them it's a VL30, then they're going to know what you're talking about. Transmission codes for these transmissions is a DZN. As you can see, I'm giving you the rest of the specs for it. Uh, it runs a fairly high-pressure system. Got a couple uh, different part numbers in that uh, uh, screen for you for uh, the different fluids for this transition. Those are the Audi part numbers, as well as your fluid capacities for the box. A couple different modes of operations we talked about a little bit earlier. You're going to have the Tiptronic mode and the Multitronic mode. Uh, again, this is available as a six-speed or a seven-speed transmission. When you're in a manual mode, you have the ability to shift through each of those different modes. When you're in Multitronic mode, that's fancy words for meaning the automatic mode, uh, it's going to go through automatically and change ratios for you without you doing anything. So the logic or the idea behind this is that it works like a regular CVT at that point. Giving you simply a display here of what those two modes actually are. Again, if you're in the Tiptronic mode, there are defined ratios for each gear that you select. So as you push the button on your steering wheel or move your shift lever, it's going to physically feel like the car is shifting. When you're in the automatic mode, it is transparent to the customer, just like most CVTs are. When you move the shift lever itself into the uh, D gate, you're in the automatic mode. That's what we're showing you right here. So the Prindle is going to come over, highlight the D button itself, and the transmission is going to work like any other CVT works. When you move the shift lever to the right into the uh, uh, Tiptronic position, then you're going to have the ability to shift the transmission manually, either with the shift lever or obviously with the steering wheel controls that you're going to have for your tap shifts. So whichever way you wanted to do that, it's up to you. Uh, but the bottom line is you're going to have manual control uh, of this transmission anytime you choose the Tiptronic uh, selection. As I talked about earlier, the uh, flywheel itself, we don't use a torque converter. We've got a flywheel. we got what looks like a clutch plate, but it's not a clutch plate. It's just a dampener assembly. The dampener assembly is there simply to take away the power impulses. Uh, the dual mass flywheel or the dampener do basically the same job, take out the engine firing pulses that you get in the engine. So again, there's no clutch that you're going to release. Uh, there's no torque converter with this system. When you pull up to a stop sign, it's physically going to slip a clutch. The clutches that we're talking about slipping here, you're seeing popping up on your screen right now. Those are your reverse clutch and your forward clutches. Uh, the reverse clutch itself, as you can see, is the outermost clutch mounted into the case. Uh, piston is in the front housing uh, for the reverse clutch. And then the forward clutch that sits right inside of that, as you can see there. So again, when we're moving forward range, 
Uh, you're going to have the forward clutch physically operating. Reverse range, you're going to have the reverse clutch engaged. You can see the front planetary right there. That's controlled, as you can see, by the reverse clutch for this transmission. And the job is to turn those gears backwards. So bottom line, guys, is very simple as far as operation of those two clutches. Either you're going to have the forward clutch on or you're going to have the reverse clutch on. If you're stationary, then you're going to have slippage through those clutches. Now, the planetary that we use for reverse establishes reverse position for those gears. The other thing that happens in reverse, just like happens with a, uh, a another type of CVT, like we took you through the uh, Chrysler uh, Jackco CVT, we said when you selected reverse with those CVTs, that the transmission actually went into a fixed ratio for the pulleys. Well, this thing does exactly the same thing. So the pulley ratios will be fixed anytime you choose reverse range. Now, you can see those variators, or the pulleys, and, of course, the belt there, and you can see the pinion shaft going to the middle of that. In order to get that whole assembly out of there, you've got to do one of two things. Either you're going to have to take a couple links out of the chain, uh, which is what Audi recommends that you do, and take the chain off, and then you can take the pieces out one at a time, or you're going to have to press the pinion shaft out using a port of power uh, to get the pinion shaft out of there so that you can get everything out of the transmission itself. So bottom line is that pinion shaft is pressed in place. On the right-hand side, you see the uh, device there in bright yellow. That, of course, is your TCM. Then the device there in green, that, of course, is your uh, valve body that you have for this transmission. So the TCM is mounted right under the back of the transmission itself, interfaces right with the valve body. Now, as I talked about the variators before, this is really nothing new to you guys. Uh, your variators themselves are your pulleys, and the bottom line is, the pulleys are going to change dimensions based on torque coming in the engine or from the engine itself as well as uh, what your ratios are at the time. So when we increase one variator size, we decrease the other variator size by the same amount so that we can maintain that uh, tension on that chain and keep everybody nice and taut. Here's a look at Audi's picture on the variators themselves and changing uh, from obviously a maximum ratio to an overdrive ratio, as you can see here. So the top picture at right-hand side is showing us uh, this transmission obviously producing the maximum gear ratio. Bottom picture, you can see that the pulley dimensions have changed, and now we're producing an overdrive ratio out of the trans. Your forward clutch assembly and reverse clutch assembly are housed within this assembly that you see right here within the front cover. That cover bolts onto the front of the transmission itself. And about the only thing that's kind of strange here is if you look at that blue shaft, right where that ball bearing is mounted, you'll see that there's a front seal right there. Underneath that front seal, you'll notice that there's actually a snap ring in that location. In order to get those uh, pieces apart, in other words, to take the shaft out of that cover assembly, you have to make sure you take the snap ring out. So that means any time that this thing has got to be pushed apart, uh, you're going to have to make sure you got an extra seal laying around because you're going to have to replace the seal. So that's one of the little quirks of this system, per se. We're showing a layout of, of course, the clutches themselves so that you can see what the clutch assemblies look like. Now we're showing you actual pictures of the transmission itself. This is this cover that houses that forward and reverse clutch assembly as we talked about just a minute ago. Uh, we've unbolted the cover here. You can see the vent on the one side. We're going to pull the cover off. And we pull the cover off, as you can see, we're housing the uh, forward clutch assembly inside that front cover. Now, if you look at the uh, top of the shaft that's sticking up right there, that's your input shaft. You'll see that there's a seal there. You've got to be really careful with that seal because <clears throat> that seal is going to be your clutch feed seal. So when you go back together with this, you've got to be really delicate with that seal as well as the reverse seal. I'll show you here in a minute. This is a snap ring we talked about that's got to come out before you can push the uh, clutch drum out of the front cover. So right now what we've done is we pulled the front seal out of the transmission, popped the snap ring loose, and now we in turn can press the uh, whole assembly out of the cover, which is primarily what you're seeing popping up on your screen right now. So effectively what I've done at this point is we pop the snap ring out, pop the seal out, and we pushed or tapped that uh, 
uh, forward clutch drum assembly and your input shaft out of the front cover. Your reverse clutch, of course, is splined into the case. So just like any other clutch pack, you're going to have to be able to pull that reverse clutch out of the case itself in order to be able to service the rest of the transmission here. Now, when we look at the electronics of this system itself, the electronics are nothing different than really what you guys have dealt with for many years with many different transmissions. Uh, you're going to have, to have some input information coming in, which is going to come from sensors or switches typically. That input information may not be coming directly to the TCCM. In fact, the majority of times is coming into another module like the ECM. And then over the CAN data bus, we feed the pertinent information uh, to the TCCM so it can make decisions. So my point is you may not have, for example, the APP circuit or the brake switch circuit or any of those other circuits attached directly to the TCM. It's actually attached to the ECM and then the ECM via serial data feeds that over to what they call your gearbox control unit, we're going to call it a TCM, uh, via the CAN data bus. Now on the output side of the coin, your primary outputs for this transmission are going to be the selenites. Uh, unlike some of the other CVTs, you don't have a stepper motor to control the actual uh, variator position. They actually use a selenite and a valve to control the actual variator position. So it works a little bit different than what you've seen with some of the other transmissions that are out there. Now the TCM, as I talked about, is mounted onto the back of the transmission itself. This is a picture of the TCM. As you can see, it's got three pressure control solenoid driver circuits built into it, a couple pressure switches built into it, a multi-functional uh, switch built into it, uh, which is basically a Prindle switch, and of course, three different speed sensors, input speed sensor and two output speed sensors. The last thing that's built into the thing is going to be your tr transmission fluid temperature sensor. Now, the first thing you're going to notice is they give you some four-digit codes on all of these components here. Audi refers to all this stuff using these different code numbers. So as you can see, we've got a G196 and G195 and an N216 and so forth. Those are the code numbers they use to describe selenides and switches and so forth with this transmission. So you're going to see throughout the presentation we'll have these different codes, and that is referring to a particular selenoid switch, relay, you know, something that you're going to be basically dealing with. Now, if you notice, there are three feet on this left-hand picture sticking down from that control module. On the ends of those three feet, you got three hall sensors. Actually, you have uh, four hall sensors, in all honesty. Uh, bottom line is, you've got two output shaft speed sensors, you've got a Prindle switch, and you've got an input shaft speed sensor. That's all mounted onto those feet. Now, we talk about metal contamination being a problem. It's one of the most common problems you'll run across with this transmission is those sensors getting obviously contaminated with metal shaving. So if you've got metal particulate floating around the transmission, especially the speed sensors, it ends up getting stuck to the uh, magnets, which are, of course, the tone wheels, and you'll end up with all sorts of speed sensor code issues. So just be aware, it's been a lot of problems with metal contamination with this unit. Now, what we're controlling as selenides are these selenides we talked about earlier, N215, N216, N88. Notice N88 is a clutch uh, cooling and safety valve selenoid. And since you're slipping this uh, clutch severely when you're setting still, they've got a cooling system just for the clutches, which is probably the most important system in the whole transmission. That's controlled by the selenite. So the selenite basically looks at what your load characteristics on that clutch are and what the command for those clutches actually are. So it calculates what the slip is and then determines how much oil volume actually should be flowing to the clutch assembly. It's also got a built-in pressure relief built into the circuit itself. So for some reason that a selenite hangs up or a valve hangs up and the pressure goes too high, there's a safety system built into it. N215, that selenite itself is your clutch control selenite, so that's going to be in charge of controlling both your clutches. And of course, the N216 is your reduction selenite. That's going to be in charge of obviously controlling your uh, uh, variator for you. They're all linear style selenites, so that means in simple terms that uh, current is proportional to uh, uh, flow with the selenite itself. Now, you're going to see a lot of different terminologies as we go through this stuff today. You're looking at one of them right now. 
dynamic control program. That's fancy words that Audi uses for a program that monitors your speed between your input speed and your output speed to figure slip. And then it looks at your engine RPM and your load to calculate what the amperage should be for, as you can see, in 216, which is a pulley control solenoid. So what we're basically saying in simple English is we're going to look at how much slip you have, what the load on the engine actually is, to determine how much amperage we command the solenoid to have flowing through it, which in turn then correlates to how much pressure we actually get at the pulleys. That's the basics of how this dynamic control program works. Now, as key inputs for this dynamic control program, you're going to have your speed sensors. You've got G195, G196, as you can see there, and G182. So G195 and G186, those are going to be your output speed sensors, and G182, that's your input speed sensor. These are all hall switch style sensors. Now, if you notice, you got those feet we talked about with the yellow tabs on them there. Well, that's actually your hall sensors, those little yellow uh, tabs that we're showing you there. <clears throat> those feet are part of the control module. So there aren't any wires you can hook to. There's no circuits you can hook up to. So if you've got to diagnose a speed sensor problem with one of these transmissions, you have to use a scan tool. Now, the other little precaution we're giving you is don't pry on the speed sensors. We've had lots of people do that. They, they look kind of like seals, but they're not a seal. So don't pry on anything, because if you do, we're going to have a problem with the uh, speed sensor obviously not working correctly. The other foot you see sticking down there in gray is that middle foot between those two speed sensor feet. That is your Prindle switch that we're going to look at here in a minute. So it's a Hall effect switch also. Now the speed sensors themselves, the output speed sensor, there was two of them, G195, G196. They are offset, as you can see, 25%. So basically what it boils down to is the speed sensor square wave we get on each of those speed sensors is out of phase of each other. They do that intentionally so that they can turn, determine which way the car is moving, forward or backward. You're going to have a couple pressure sensors built into this thing. So you got G193 and G194. G193, as you can see, is a clutch pressure sensor that monitors your forward and reverse clutch. G194 is a clutch pressure sensor that actually mark, monitors your, your pressure going to your pulleys themselves. So there's a torque sensor. Here is my uh, Prindle switch. Looks a little bit different from other Prindle switches you guys have dealt with in the past. As, again, their terminology is F125, as they call the Prindle switch. But it does exactly the same functions. Starter inhibit, reverse lights, park neutral shift lock, so that you can't move the shifter unless you step under the brake. Uh, clutch control, whether you're moving forward or backward. And of course, the interesting thing is they use this to lock the ratio in reverse. So once it gives it a reverse input into the uh, control module, the control module then locks the ratio for the pulleys so that you can't back the car up too fast and get yourself in trouble. I'm going to give you the actual binary code table for the hall switch itself. So again, if you're looking at your scan tool, you can take a look at it and see if, in fact, the uh, highs and lows are where they're supposed to be. You will also find some switches, multifunction switches, uh, mounted in the shift lever itself. We still need to know when you're moving the shifter as far as doing uh, tap shifts with the shifter and so forth. So you've got some sensors built into this for that function. Brake switch, as you can see, is an input to the ECU. As I talked about many times on these cars, they don't run directly to the TCM. It's an input to the ECU. The ECU then, via the CAN data bus, feeds it over to the TCCM which they call that control module J217. So as you can see, it's used for creep control. You'd also hear that called hill hold. Uh, it's used for shifter lock. In other words, the solenoid that we're going to have that actually locks the shifter and dynamic control, which we've already talked about. Accelerator pedal position. I chose to put this in here because, again, a lot of customers don't understand this, and a lot of technicians misdiagnose this particular APP sensor. We're going to have load inputs, just like we will on any other car. Nothing different here. The difference here on this is this accelerator pedal position sensor has a step built into it. 
So it's there to fake the customer out, to make, make him feel like there's a kick-down switch like some of the old cars had. So when he tromps the pedal down, he feels it. Well, we've had technicians who have misdiagnosed it because it feels like a rough APP. It's not. It's supposed to be that way. So this is not a smooth transition as you move the accelerator pedal position sensor like it is with some other APPs that you, you obviously deal with out there. Now, we want to control our clutch pressure. We're going to use the solenoid N215. We, of course, have the G193 to monitor that actual pressure. So if you notice the schematic right there, N215 is actually controlling pressure to the end of the KSV valve. The KSV valve is then regulating that pressure that's going to go off to the clutch. And we're going to monitor the feedback for what the pressure actually is via the G193 uh, pressure switch built into the module. Now, as I talked about, there's a safety system built into this. So for some reason, because remember, these things run really high pressure. Uh, all the CVTs do. So if there's something, obviously, that goes catastrophically wrong. Uh, there's a pressure relief built into this thing. That's what we're showing. And the SIV valve acts as a pressure relief for you, opens the exhaust uh, so that you don't end up with damage, uh, physical damage to the transmission. Creep control, hill hold, micro slip. Uh, again, what you're doing here is your foot's on the brake in this instance, in this left-hand picture. And what we're showing you here is we're going to physically slip the clutch. So we drop the pressure down on the uh, forward clutch to allow the forward clutch to physically slip a little bit. Basically, that acts as your torque converter uh, for this transmission. So again, that means that you're going to have to have very, very good cooling for that clutch assembly. That cooling is provided by a clutch cooling circuit. Both clutches are fed from that cooling circuit. So as you can see on the uh, right-hand side, I'm showing you the forward clutch cooling circuit. On the uh, next one, right next to that, it's the reverse clutch cooling circuit. So bottom line, guys, is we're going to push a, a huge amount of oil volume through that circuit itself uh, to try to, to dissipate heat from those clutch discs. So that means that the pump operation is transmission pretty critical. We're going to use a jet-style pump very similar to the fuel injection pump that they use nowadays, uh, so that obviously they can increase volume very, very rapidly. And the idea behind that is to feed that oil volume into the clutch to act as a cooling agent for the clutch. Now, the other solenoid N216, he's used to control the stroke on your pulleys. So as you can see, the N216 solenoid there in the left-hand picture is putting oil pressure there in yellow to the left-hand end of the UV valve, the underdrive valve. That, of course, puts pressure up to your pulleys, as you can see here, uh, stroking the different pulleys. And again, now we're showing this in maximum underdrive in the left-hand picture. As we change the duty cycle on that N216 solenoid in the right-hand side, we're changing the position of that UV valve, which then changes the pressure going to both those pulleys. And what we're basically trying to show you here is we now have the pulleys moved into the overdrive position. So we can vary those pulleys anywhere between those two spots we're showing you on the picture. Now, you're going to have an auxiliary gear set in this thing, just like we talked about the planetary gear set also. So you can see your shaft has got a gear that sits on the end of it. Again, you got a planetary in there along with that. Planetary, remember, is used for reverse. The auxiliary gear set is used to just give you a gear reduction and connect you to the pulley drive shaft itself. Now, this is probably the most interesting thing about this whole transmission is right here. They've got a device they call a torque sensor. It's basically a mechanical sensor that senses torque. If you look at the picture here that shows you where the ball is at, we're showing you that the uh, torque sensor actually has a series of balls and tapered ramps. So what's going to happen is we put uh, engine torque through that gear set those balls are going to try to walk up their ramps. When they try to walk up their ramps, they try to push on that pulley. Well, effectively what they're doing is if you look at the left-hand picture, we're going to control with the, that torque sensor those holes that are feeding your oil pressure into the pulley mechanism. So we're not only going to control your pressure for your pulley with uh, valving and, of course, solenoids. We're also going to control it 
with looking at the raw engine torque coming into the transmission, moving that torque sensor, which then changes the oil flow through the passages that actually feed the pulley. So it's kind of an interesting little feature. It is also the number one failing item in these transmissions. Now there will also be some balance oil in here. Again, the balance oil is just like a compensator circuit oil uh, that you have in a lot of the six-speed transmissions. It's used to basically push the piston back, give you some resistance to movement of the piston itself, and to make sure the piston returns when we get rid of the oil pressure behind it. Now, as I talked about the chain before, we said there were two different chains that Audi had, a wide one and a narrow one. Make sure, again, that you get the right chain for your application. If you fail to get the right chain, because we've had this happen numerous times, you'll end up with the wrong ratio. So make sure you measure your chain. Even though it's pretty self-explanatory, make sure you check it to make sure you're putting the right chain back in there. The other thing you're going to probably notice is the pinion is actually attached to that pulley mechanism right there. As I talked about earlier, you have a couple different choices. Uh, you can take a link out of the chain and take it out uh, one piece at a time, or you can press the uh, pinion shaft out with the porter power and then take everything as you see out of the transmission there per se. Now I said one of the critical parts of this transmission is the oil pump. Again, we're running really high oil pressures, so the oil pump becomes a real essential item. It is a suction style jet pump. Uh, so again, there's a Venturi built into this thing, just like they use in the uh, uh, fuel injection pumps, so that they can change oil volume immediately with this thing. So again, remember this thing is relying on you to have good oil volume for clutch cooling. So the pump has got to be in very, very good condition or else you're going to have oil volume issues and burn clutches. Now remember the TCCM or TCM bolts onto the back of the transmission itself. We're actually bolted onto the valve body. As you can see, the valve body is going to control which clutch you get on. It's going to control the pressure from the clutches, your clutch cooling, uh, your pressure that goes to the pulleys. That's all going to be controlled through the valve body via the TCM. So the TCM is uh, feeding electrical impulses right into that valve body to those solenoids, and of course is going to control the operation of those solenoids. Now, in your handout, I will give given you, or I did give you, all of the uh, functions of all the different valves. So again, you're going to see all the valves laid out there, so you'll know exactly what each valve's function actually is as well as a nice layout of where the valves are actually located at. The cooling system that you have in this transition is fairly simple. Notice it does have an ATF filter built into it. That filter does have a bypass built into the filter itself. <clears throat> so again, the filter is going to be a serviceable item on these transmissions. All right, let's talk about transmission issues. The Prindle is going to be the indication to the customer he has something wrong with it. Uh, the other indication is it doesn't want to move. That might also be an indication he may have as a complaint. But way before it ever got to it didn't want to move, he's going to have Prindle indications that you're going to try to get his attention. In this instance, we're showing the Prindle's not doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, we're saying that's a not critical situation here, but it means you probably need to have somebody look at it. The number two, it lifts the Prindle all the way up. We're saying that's an inverted Prindle. I'm not sure where they get the term inverted, because to me, inverted means either backwards or upside down. Uh, here, they're simply showing all the lights lit at one time. Uh, so you've chosen drive, and it's basically lit every light in the display of the Prindle itself. So uh, again, if you see that, that means that there is something wrong. You need to get it in for service. If it starts flashing at you, as we're showing in the bottom display, uh, you probably better be paying attention because it's going to leave you in tennis shoe mode here. You're going to be hitchhiking along the highway trying to get a ride in, obviously because your car quit working. So this thing is going to go to neutral on you, but it starts flashing, and it's not going to work again. Now, your number one failing item in this transition we talked about a little bit before was the uh, torque sensor. This is the torque sensor. This is what they do. So if you've got a no movement situation, usually it's one of two things. Usually it's either the torque sensor itself has given up the ghost, like we're showing you here, or you busted the variator shaft, like I'm showing you right here. In either instance, that means it's going to be pretty expensive to you. So as you can see here, the variator is a very expensive piece 
piece of uh, uh, parts to fix this transmission. So bottom line is those are the two uh, areas that will cause you typically a no movement condition. We've had lots of issues with metal getting in these units. When they do, they usually end up scoring the forward clutch housing. So again, if you've had any metal floating around, take a real hard look at your forward clutch housing. Very good chance you're going to see damage to the housing like you see in this particular picture right here. Now let's take a look at some uh, TSBs from Audi on what you need to pay attention to. 1793 output speed sensor code. Prindle, of course, is inverted, which basically means all the elements are lit. Again, if you've got a Prindle or a output speed sensor code or a rain switch code, uh, again, they're telling you you're going to have to put a TCM in this vehicle. Code 1743. If you run across this as a code, you may have a delayed engagement, uh, doesn't want to move. I realize this talks about uh, problems of less than 13,000 miles. Where we run into this, guys, is a problem after somebody's repaired it. So they're talking about seal issues. These are the two seals we talked about before, the forward clutch seal and the reverse clutch seal. They're very easy to damage those seals upon installation. You'll end up with this code set, and of course you may end up with uh, delayed engagements or no movement, those sorts of issues. These are the seals we're talking about right here. So bottom line is you've got to be really careful. You've got to lube everything up because, again, if you damage those seals, you're going to end up with an issue with the uh, uh, transmission either delayed engagement or doesn't want to move in one direction or the other direction. Here's a look at those tube seals as we talked about. There's my forward tube seal and my reverse tube seal. So again, you're going to want to pay real close attention to those tube seals and make sure that everybody's a happy camper there. Here's a look at the tube seals and how they lay out in the transmission. And now let's talk about getting the uh, uh, unit apart. As we talked about earlier, if you do decide that you're going to uh, uh, pull it out as a unit like this where you pull the pinion out, then you're going to have to either use a compression tool on the uh, hub itself or you're going to have to physically pull the links out in order to get the chain off. There's not enough room on this thing to basically take the chain off without compressing the uh, variator pulley. Okay, let's take a look at a couple other issues. Code 1793, code 706, again, Prindle inverted. What's the solution? Again, this is simply an update to the other bulletin that you just had. Uh, again, what they're telling you to do is put a TCM in it if you run into this as an issue. Well, that pretty well completes our presentation for today, guys. I appreciate everybody's attention. I appreciate you obviously popping in, and certainly appreciate the guys from Seal Aftermarket Products for sponsoring our webinars. Your next webinar is going to be, let me pull my calendar out here, is going to be May 7th. So same time, same place, May 7th, which is going to be on the 6040 Generation 2 updates. So again, real important updates. You need to be, be sure that you attend that thing because, again, it can be one of those things that costs you an awful lot of money if you're not aware of what updates were actually made to this transmission because of parts interchangeability issues uh, with it we're going to spend a bunch of time on. So again, don't see any questions popping up. Hope you guys enjoyed yourselves today. Again, there's a survey that follows this. And until uh, a couple weeks from now, have yourself a great week, guys.